This segment of WGCU's Local Untold Stories is underwritten by Lee County Government, County Commission, Charlotte County Airport Authority, City of Naples Airport Authority, Lee County Mosquito Control District. Southwest Florida's wild blue yonder once served as practice flying ground for more than 80,000 fighter pilots, bombardiers, and gunners. While postcard perfect beaches proved exceptional for R&R, stunningly splendid skies also prepared many men to meet their maker. Though there's one motor gone, we can still carry on, coming in on a wing and a prayer. During World War I, two airfields in the small town of Arcadia trained some of the first fighter pilots in history. During World War II, those two airfields reactivated and others in Clewiston, Fort Myers, Punta Gorda, and Naples hurried to train flyboys for combat. Arcadia was called the aviation city of Florida in World War I because there were so few uh, flying fields and especially training uh, uh, primary flyers or the first stages of ground school and flight, flight school. So we had the go ahead to be uh, known throughout the United States because the weather was so good, the land was so flat and the grass was so green. Both airfields built in Arcadia were dedicated in name to early aviation pioneers. They were critical to the very first wartime buildup of U.S. air power. American troops were trained exclusively at Crosstrum Field and Dorfield during World War I, although it had been selected by the French. At Carlstrom and Dorf Fields, America's very first fighter pilots got their wings training on Curtis Jennies and other early aircrafts. Some went on to fight air battles over France under General Billy Mitchell. Following World War I, both fields went dormant for some time, but during the 30s, the need to build up U.S. air power would once again turn attention to the sunny skies of Southwest Florida. In 1938, the Army Air Corps decided they needed an official song. Liberty Magazine sponsored a contest. 757 scores were submitted. One written by Robert Crawford was selected by a committee of Air Corps wives. By March of 1941, Carlstrom Field was back in action. Operated by civilian contractor Embry Riddle, the $1 million facility had a country club reputation for its spiffy appearance and was the largest non-military flight center in the country. More than 7,500 flyboys would train there. One of the first cadets to graduate from Carlstrom went on to fight in the Battle of Coral Sea. Carlstrom Field has a, had at that time the, the record of the United States safest flying field without a fatality and George Ola was commander of the field at that time, so he's endeared to Arcadia, Marina, Arcadia girl. But anyway, it was the safest in the United States. For a brief time, British cadets trained side by side the Americans at Carlstrom Field. However, their high washout rate and their disdain for West Point rigidity and hazing antics prompted another plan. In August 1941, the British awarded Embry-Riddle a $2 million contract to construct and operate the British Flying School No. 5 on 2,500 acres in Clewiston, 
also known as Riddle Field. The Rotary Club of Arcadia acquired a portion of the cemetery at Oak Ridge here in Arcadia for the burial of the British cadets who died while they were in training here. Some of them died from uh, actual plane crashes and some of them died from drowning in automobile accidents. But none of them were from Carlstrom Field that died from flight. 23 Brits are buried alongside John Paul Riddle, an American who trained at Carlstrom Field in 1920. He then went on to establish the Embry-Riddle flight schools. Riddle was made an honorary member of the British Empire in 1945. Also by contract with Embry-Riddle, Arcadia's Dorr Field was rebuilt at the cost of $750,000 and was rushed to reopen two weeks after Pearl Harbor. Dorr Field would train another 7,000 cadets. Other Southwest Florida airfields didn't have a civilian contractor, but were operated by the U.S. Army. Named after local resident Captain Richard Channing Page, a World War I flying ace who went down in the Everglades in 1920, Page Field opened in Fort Myers in March 1942. Back in early 1942, Page Field be officially became the uh, advanced training base for uh, the Army Air Force and Page Field was used as an advanced base as opposed to primary training base. For instance, the pilots would go to a base maybe in Texas or Oklahoma, learn how to fly airplanes, get trained in an airplane such as the B-24, which was a, a four-engine heavy bomber, and then come to Page Field for advanced training prior to moving on to Europe, uh, prior to going to war. Over the land, over the sea, up in the air, the fighting Yankees over Training for some very notable World War II missions took place at Page Field, including the infamous raid on Tokyo in May 1942. Colonel Jimmy Doolittle, uh, as everyone knows, uh, made the first raid on Tokyo uh, in B-25 bombers. They were two-engine bombers. And of course, it was a symbol at that time. They really didn't do any damage. But it took a lot of homework in order to pull that off because they flew those bombers off of an aircraft carrier, which was unheard of at the time. But some say that Jimmy Doolittle first came out to Page Field with the B-25s to test the concept. And what he did is he stripped everything out of the B-25s to make them as light as possible. And they tested the concept here to see just how short a distance they could utilize before they could get those airplanes in the air. Uh, after that, of course, they went on to an air, uh, air base in South Carolina to actually train the crews to do it. The 98th Bombardment Group, the first to train at Page Field, went on to fly in the August 1943 raid of the Ploesti oil refineries in Romania. In that raid, 47 B-24s launched, and only 21 returned safely. Some of the bombing groups that were here in the B-24 were the 98th Bomb Group and the 93rd. And it's pretty interesting to note that the 98th actually flew the Puesti raid, and they were based in North Africa. They flew it out of North Africa, and uh, it was probably one of the worst raids uh, in World War II, meaning of the, the greatest loss, loss of aircraft and life. The 93rd Bombardment Group even fought the war here at home. They actually sunk three German U-boats right out there in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, it's kind of hard for this generation to, to really fathom how close the war was to us here in Florida, but there were German U-boats sinking American ships off the east coast of Florida quite a bit. I mean, I, I know people that, that used to watch the ships burning off the coast of Florida. The ships would, would uh, fuel up in South America and, and some told me Mexico, but so they were close. It was easy for them to get to the Gulf of Mexico, so they were a real threat. And what's really neat is to think that these bombers were actually able to sink U-boats with bombs. I mean, that is such a difficult feat. So that, it tells you just how, how talented that crew was to be able to do a thing like that. After discovering that its relatively short runways couldn't accommodate the switch from B-24s to B-26s, officials shifted the focus of Page Field. Now in 1943, Page Field changed to an advanced fighter training base. And they actually had four different fighters assigned here. 
Uh, one was a P-39, a P-40, a P-47, but one of the most famous of all fighters was the P-51, such as the one I have in my hands here. That was the, the Cadillac of the fighters in World War II, by the way. It was the most advanced fighter, and they, uh, they trained pilots here in advanced modes prior to uh, departing for the European theater. And what they learned here, for instance, was gunnery practice, uh, was tight formation flying, low level, high level, uh, acrobatics, um, all different kinds of combat, te uh, combat techniques prior to uh, leaving for war. And the, one thing to note is that, of course, these are all young people. These are maybe somebody that's 20 years old, and they maybe got 80 or 90 hours flying time in training, and nowadays that's just unheard of. But th because they needed pilots uh, drastically, they were just pushing these guys through as fast as they could. Meanwhile, some 12 miles northeast of Pagefield, the largest World War II operation in southwest Florida opened in September 1942. More than 50,000 men would be trained as gunners at Buckingham Army Airfield. I graduated from, the, from the cadet school and uh, was transferred to the flexible gunnery program in Tyndall Field in Panama City. And after a year there, we opened the field in Buckingham and I was transferred from up there down here. Uh, we had to write a program on flexible gunnery. I didn't even know what flexible gunnery was, and so we had to get some technical orders and develop a program. And it was pretty crude to start with, but it was developed as we went along. And of course, it, flexible gunnery only lasted during the period of the war. It, after that, well, remote, uh, jet planes that came out, that came out and remote control guns, and uh, they were used, so our flexible gun rig was not needed anymore. With 16,000 men and women on the base, Buckingham's enlistees, officers, and workers outnumbered the local population of about 10,000 in Fort Myers in the early 40s. Many men who came to Buckingham were washouts from flight school. Most of them went on to train as gunners, one of the most deadly roles in the war. A few found other assignments. I became acquainted with the air sea rescue operation they had at Fort Myers Beach and uh, lobbied heavily for a job uh, at, at that location and was fortunate enough to be uh, sent there December the 7th, 1942. And um, the air sea rescue base was created to search and rescue for men, pilots that had been accidentally or somehow uh, crashed into the Gulf and so forth. And we had a uh, station at Fort Myers Beach was our, our base. And from that base, we had outpost at Boca Grande, Sanibel Island, Fort Myers Beach, of course, uh, uh, Big Carlos Pass, Naples, and Marco. Eventually they built a second base at, at Marco. Uh, and uh, I was uh, NCO in charge of both bases for, for a while. Meanwhile, at the 6,500-acre field at Buckingham, servicemen and women made the best of times. At the same time, however, men were learning how to shoot to kill. Of course, uh, the, all we gave them was the basics on gunnery, because a lot of these boys had never shot a shotgun. They came from the sidewalks <laughs> of the cities and they never shot a shotgun. And, and we had to start with shotguns, rifled shotguns, and build them up to machine guns and uh, get them familiar with it. I know the first time I fired two, two machine guns right inside your ears right here, <laughs> it's sort of frightening. Not all men had hoped to be pilots. Many of them came from, uh, they were enlisted men who came from Chinook Field. They were airplane mechanics. We had some that were already trained as radio operators. And uh, some of them just came in straight raw from, from home, you know. And uh, the, the ones who, we offered them a, a three a basic a buck sergeant it, when they graduated with, without a 
technical school ahead of them if he'd been to, to radio school, navigation school, or something like that, we, he'd, they'd make them staff sergeants, which was a pretty nice grade. And so a lot of boys could write home and say, hey, mama, I'm, I'm a sergeant. <laughs> I've been here five weeks, and I'm already a sergeant. <laughs> Actual in-flight training took place out over the Gulf of Mexico. That was our firing range. We, uh, a certain area was designated out there, and it, the fish, fishing boats had to stay out because we fired right over them. The Fort Myers Beach Sea and Rescue Unit assisted in at least eight accidents. One involved the local captain and a GI outpost off the lighthouse on Sanibel Island. Well, you have to, to realize that the pilots were in their early 20s and uh, they'd never been in an airplane in their life and, and uh, they did a lot of foolish things. This pilot was flying a, an A-40A, an A-20A, which was a, um, a 20 inch and medium bomber that had a pilot, a, a gunner, and a radio operator. And he saw Cap, Captain Alderman anchored off of Sanibel Island, so he buzzed him, and just for fun, you know. The prop wash would practically blow the boat out of the water. Well, he did that twice. He had to circle and go back over Pine Island Sound and come across the point. And Cap Alderman was smart enough to know that he could get killed if he stayed there. So he pulled the anchor and um, headed for shore. He wasn't too far offshore. And uh, this captain, his name, I believe, was Bell. And he came around the third time and clipped the top out of a cabbage palm. And as it, the boat struck shore, the plane cut the stern right off, just like it was done with a saw. And the plane crashed, and it threw the, the pilot clear but it killed the gunner and uh, the radio operator. And uh, the uh, pilot uh, yelled for life and they went out and rescued him. Page and Buckingham Fields worked in tandem at times. This was a real small base, only 618 acres and maybe 1,600 people strong, which included support personnel, mechanics, cooks, everything. So it was a real tiny base. Compare that to Buckingham, and they had over 16,000 men and women over there, so it was uh, quite a contrast. Uh, Page Field did, however, participate with the Buckingham training. For instance, the Buckingham would take the, the new gunners up in the airplanes, and they needed target practice, and they would bring fighters up from Page Field to add realism to it, so the fighters would fly at the bombers to simulate uh, German aircraft flying at the bombers during uh, combat. So they all worked together. Some men were stationed on the outlying barrier islands. There were some people stationed on Sanibel. They were radio operators. And what their job was to keep the beach clear because they used the beach for gunnery practice. So these guys kind of had it made. When you think about it, they're all by themselves. They're out at the beach. Uh, they'd spend a lot of time on the beach. They'd go fishing. So it was kind of a nice life. Uh, there actually was a tourist area, too, further on down uh, on the beach, but they had the beach all of themselves. Naples Army Airfield served as an auxiliary unit for the Buckingham Gunnery School. Naples Army Air uh, Drone was opened in December 23, 1943. It took them almost a year and a half to build, and they were only operational for a year and a half. They had incredible problems with the runways and with uh, the building of this airfield. The purpose of the Naples Airfield was to be an auxiliary to Buckingham Army Airfield and train gunners and pilots to um, use the flexible gunnery training program as well as training ground crew in how to maintain the uh, P-39s and the P-40s, which eventually became known as the pinballs. Men and women from all three fields found ways to accentuate the positive. Got to accentuate the positive I was 
starstruck. I mean, uh, the beaches, they were all so beautiful, and uh, uh, the clouds, you know, just unreal in the skies and the stars at night. It's just, it was, a, and the, the palm trees uh, just were magnificent. I've been told that duty here on Naples Airfield was much coveted because it was a, a destination of beach parties when um, they needed to alleviate the pressures of training um, and the constant knowledge that the war was on. So coming to Southwest Florida for a, a duty was much coveted. They could do their beach parties. We had the USO coming to this airfield as well as Buckingham and um, they would bring all sorts of entertainment and movies and, um, and parties for the guys. Both Page and Buckingham Fields had their own orchestras to entertain at weekly dances. The USO scored some big hits in Fort Myers. Hollywood legend Judy Garland performed. Danny Kaye and Leo DeRocher lightened spirits. Enraptured by the beauty of the local scenery and marrying local girls meant some of the luckiest souls would live out their years in Southwest Florida. Fort Myers has always been a, a, a laid-back community. Uh, a lot of people call it a cow town, but um, when I came down here uh, from Arcadia, I came down on a on a bus and with a barracks bag and was dropped off in front of the arcade theater as a as were a rendezvous point and. Uh, uh, it was so clean and so beautiful, you know. And uh, we were picked up to take out to, to Buckingham uh, Air Force Base, you know. And, and it's just always sort of overwhelmed me that uh, uh, 40 years later I bought the property and the where the arcade theater is. <laughs> so, it, it, it's, I say that not in a tone of conceit or anything, it's just that it was such a wonderful feeling to do that. And I, I'm still uh, uh, sort of overwhelmed by the thought. Others didn't even make it through training. The most tragic accident in Collier County occurred a few days, a few months after they opened this airfield. A B-17 and an AT-6 were on their return to this airfield and the AT-6 was doing maneuvers and caught the back of the B-17 and they both plunged in the water. The crew of the B-17 were killed and their bodies weren't found for, some of the bodies weren't found for months. And that remains the worst aviation disaster in Collier County. At Page Field, one soldier was struck by lightning and killed in the squadron area. Numerous planes went down in the Everglades. To avoid such disasters, an airfield in Immokalee served as an emergency landing strip. Further north, the rudimentary Punta Gorda Army Airfield served as a secondary base during World War II. The purpose of the airfield was a sub-base for the Sarasota Airfield, and it consisted of P-40 aircraft and they were training men for advanced pilot training and also it had a gunfire hangar where airplanes were secured and then he fired into this hangar which contained sand and this way they could calibrate the weaponry. Actually the aircraft that were here, the P-40s and later on the P-51s, this was material that was considered restricted and secret. So the operations that were taking place here were not for public information. Everything done here was secret. In fact, very few photographs ever got out of here for that reason. Punta Gorda also served as a fighter replacement training facility. Trained pilots were immediately shipped wherever they were needed. They trained pilots for replacement for fighter pilots of planes that were lost in operations. And that was the primary function of this airport. It was to replace fighter pilots and fighter aircraft that were down in operation for one reason or another. That was the primary function, training and replacement. To honor the history of military aviation and its importance in Southwest Florida's history, fundraising efforts are underway 
to open a military heritage and aviation museum at the Charlotte County Airport. What we're doing now is we hired an architect who gave us a concept drawing and this museum is beautiful, 40,000 square foot, contains a theater which will someday be able to uh, project the uh, IMAX film and it will be located at the airport. The concept drawing was approved in 2004 by the airport authority and so we're going ahead and now we're in the midst of a campaign to get this new museum built. Here's to the flyboys of Southwest Florida skies. Coming in on the wing and a prayer. Coming in on a wing and a prayer. Though there's one more gone, we can still carry on. Coming in on the wing and the prayer. To purchase a copy of this and other WGCU produced programs, go to WGCU.org or call 1 888 824 0030. This program was produced for the citizens of Southwest Florida by WGCU Public Media. Show your appreciation for programs like these. Become a member of WGCU, a business supporter, or leave a legacy through a state or planned gift. Visit our website at wgcu.org.